Hey everyone, this is Anne, reporting to you from on location at Exotic, my house. Today, I'm going to be talking about a mystery that I am sure is on everyone's minds. Locks! Well, no, not lock locks, like locks. As in the Irish, Scottish, and Gaelic word used for lakes and sea inlets. You may have heard of an especially famous one located in the Scottish Highlands named Loch Ness. This loch is pretty unique among freshwater lakes, and much, much deeper than most. Loch Ness is 24 miles long, one and a half miles wide, and over 750 feet deep. That's deeper than a skyscraper with 50 stories. It is the largest body of water in the United Kingdom, which includes England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And there's evidence that it was once connected to the ocean. This fact, along with its mysterious deaths, have long fueled rumors of a large creature living beneath its icy cold waves. A monster who has been spotted in the loch for almost 1,500 years. An incredible expanse of dark, forbidding water. Countless investigators have tried to uncover its secrets on the quest for the Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster, also known by the nickname Nessie, is probably the creature that most often leaps to mind when ordinary people think about cryptozoology, the study of hidden animals, or creatures who may or may not exist. The Loch Ness Monster has probably been the subject of more media attention than any other cryptid, with the possible exception of Bigfoot. Hey, buddy. The monster is described as an animal with sleek, rubbery, blackish-gray skin, about 20 feet long. Witnesses usually report that Nessie has a long neck and a serpentine body that is typical for sightings of sea serpents and lake monsters, with the addition of one or more humps along its back and one or more sets of fins or paddles, or sometimes stumpy legs. Nessie's head is often described as roughly horse-shaped. It may have a straggly mane running down its neck, and some witnesses report small horns or a crest, especially those who see the Loch Ness Monster from close up. These features are why some people have nicknamed the creature Water Horse. Sometimes, witnesses report a smaller, rounded, turtle-like head. This head is the one that seems to appear in most of the famous Nessie photos. Even before the wave of sightings that started today's fad, there were older legends of water dragons and kelpies in the Loch Ness and other Scottish lochs. Described as horse-like monsters, stories about these creatures were intended to frighten children into staying out of the water. Interestingly, a study of Highland folklore references to Kelpies, water horses, and water bulls indicated that the Ness was the loch most frequently sighted in these legends. Reports of a monster inhabiting Loch Ness date back to ancient times. Local stone carvings by a group of tribes in the Scottish Highlands, known as the Picts, illustrated a mysterious beast with a long neck and flippers. These carvings were made some 1,500 years ago and are the earliest evidence that Loch Ness might harbor strange aquatic creatures. The first written account appears as a biography of St. Columba from 565 AD. According to that work, a monster attacked a swimmer and was prepared to attack another man when St. Columba intervened, ordering the beast to go back. It obeyed, and in the centuries afterwards, only occasional sightings were reported. The first modern report of a strange creature in the loch may have been in the 1870s, when a Mr. D. Mackenzie reportedly saw an object resembling a log or an upturned boat wriggling and churning up the water. The object moved slowly at first, disappearing at a faster speed. But in 1933, the Loch Ness Monster's legend really began to grow. At the time, a road adjacent to the Loch Ness was finished, offering an unobstructed view of the lake. In April of that year, an elderly couple saw an enormous animal while they were driving around the loch, and after it crossed their car's path, it disappeared into the water. According to the witnesses, it looked like 
the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal that I have ever seen in my life, waddling across the road toward the lake and carrying an animal in its mouth. They described it as having a long neck which moved up and down in the manner of a scenic railway. The body was fairly big with a high back, but if there were any feet they must have been of the web kind, and as for a tail I cannot say, as it moved so rapidly and we got to the spot it had probably disappeared into the lock. In July of the same year, another couple also witnessed a most extraordinary form of animal cross the road in front of their car. They described the creature as having a large body, about four feet high and about twenty-five feet long, and a long, wavy, narrow neck, slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk, and as long as the ten to twelve foot width of the road. They saw no limbs. It lurched across the road toward the lock twenty yards away, leaving a trail of broken undergrowth in its wake. The incident was reported in a Scottish newspaper, and soon numerous other sightings followed. These stories soon reached the national, and later international, press, which described a monster fish, a sea serpent, a dragon, before eventually setting on naming it Loch Ness Monster. In December of 1933, the first purported photograph of the monster, taken by Hugh Gray, was published in the Daily Express, and shortly afterwards, the Secretary of State for Scotland ordered the police to prevent any attacks upon the creature. By now, a newspaper called the Daily Mail had taken interest in the case and commissioned Marmaduke Wetherill, a big game hunter, to locate the monster. Shortly after, he found large footprints along the lake shores and that he believed belonged to a very powerful, soft-footed animal about 20 feet long. But on closer inspection, zoologists at the Natural History Museum determined that the tracks were identical and appeared to have been made with a model of a hippopotamus foot. Weatherall's role in this hoax was unclear, but he's going to show up again later in the story, so remember that name. The sightings continued. The next year, in January of 1934, a veterinary student named Arthur Grant claimed to have nearly hit the creature while riding his motorcycle near the lock at about 1 a.m. on a moonlit night. According to Grant, it looked like a cross between a seal and a plesiosaur, an extinct marine reptile that lived millions of years ago. Grant even produced a sketch of the creature he had encountered. Although skeptics claim he must have seen an otter or a seal and simply mistaken it for something else in the poor light conditions. In April 1934, interest was further sparked by another photograph. It was the first photo of the creature's head and neck and popularized the image of Nessie having a long, upward protruding neck like that of a swan. Reportedly taken by Robert Kenneth Wilson, a London doctor, it was published in the Daily Mail on April 21, 1934. But strangely, Wilson refused to have his name associated with the photo, so it came to be known as the Surgeon's Photograph. According to Wilson, he was looking at the lock when he saw the monster, grabbed his camera, and snapped four photos. Only two exposures came out. The first reportedly shows a small head and back, and the second shows a similar head in a diving position. The second photo attracted less publicity because of its blurriness. For 60 years, the photo was considered evidence of the monster's existence. Although skeptics dismissed it as driftwood, an elephant, an otter, or a bird, the photo's scale was controversial. It was often shown cropped, making the creatures seem larger and the ripples like waves. An analysis of the full photograph indicated that the object was actually small, only about two to three feet long. Then in 1999, details of how the photo was taken were published in a book titled Nessie, The Surgeon's Photograph Exposed. The creature turned out to be a prop, which had a head and neck made from wood putty, attached to a toy submarine built by Christian Sperling, the son-in-law of Marmaduke Wetherill. 
Remember him? After he found Nessie footprints that turned out to be a hoax, Weatherall had been publicly ridiculed by his employer, the Daily Mail. So, to get revenge, Weatherall came up with a plan and, with the help of some co-conspirators, built a tiny monster model. After testing it out in a local pond, the group went to the Loch Ness where they took the famous photos. Weatherall gave the photographic plates to Wilson, who was a friend of his and who enjoyed a good practical joke. Wilson then sold the photos to the Daily Mail, who fell for the trick and gleefully announced that the monster had been photographed. Photographs, video, and other evidence of the Loch Ness Monster continue to be reported into present day. Many of them have skeptics who have different ideas of what all these Nessie sightings could really be. In 1960, aeronautical engineer Tim Dinsdale filmed a hump which left a wake crossing the Loch Ness. He described it as reddish with a blotch on its side. Others were skeptical, saying that the hump could not be ruled out as being a boat, and indeed, when the contrast on the video is increased, a man in a boat can be seen. In 1977, Anthony Shields, camping next to Urquhart Castle, took what he claimed to be some of the clearest pictures of the monster until this day. Shields, a magician and a psychic, supposedly summoned the animal out of the water. He later described it as an elephant squid, claiming the long neck shown in the photograph is actually the squid's trunk, and that a white spot at the base of the neck is its eye. Due to the lack of ripples, it has been declared a hoax by a number of people, and has been nicknamed the Muppet Nessie because of its staged look. In 2011, Loch Ness boat captain Marcus Atkinson photographed a sonar image of a five-foot-wide, unidentified object which seemed to follow his boat for two minutes at a depth of 75 feet and ruled out the possibility of it being a small fish or seal. But, in 2012, a scientist from the National Oceanography Center said that the image is a bloom of algae and zooplankton. Finally, in 2013, tourist David Elder presented a five-minute video of a mysterious wave in the lock. According to Elder, the wave was produced by a 15-foot solid black object just under the surface of the water. He was taking a picture of a swan when he captured the movement, and, reportedly, the water was very still at the time, and there were no ripples coming off the wave and no other activity on the water. But, once again... Skeptics have another theory, saying that the wave may have been caused by a gust of wind. Alright, so now that you've heard the stories, let's start with the theories. Since these stories about Nessie have been going on for so long, people have a wide range of ideas to explain the monster sightings, including a giant version of another animal, such as a fish, a log, seals traveling in a line, elephants, a weird wave, hallucinations, local animals misidentified, large, exotic, possibly extinct animals, and the weather. It's difficult to judge the size of an object in water through a telescope or binoculars with no external reference. Loch Ness has resident otters, and photos of them and deer swimming in the loch might easily be mistaken for something more mysterious. Water birds, such as ducks and geese floating on the surface, have a profile that can look a lot like the famous surgeon's photograph. Another explanation is weather or waves. Loch Ness, because of its long straight shape, is subject to unusual ripples affecting its surface. Wind conditions can give a choppy, matte appearance to the water with calm patches appearing dark from the shore, reflecting the mountains. Boat turbulence also tends to remain on the surface of the water for some time, long after the ships pass out of sight due to the narrowness of the loch, giving their wakes a life of their own. And once a wake is up and running, the combination of shadows from the steep hills and dark lake waters can all easily create monster-like shapes. Additionally, because of its great depth, the water never gets too cold in winter or too warm in summer. It never freezes. In winter, the relatively warm water meets colder air, producing mirages on the surface. And the winds of late summer can create something called a seiche, a rolling underwater wave driving the surface waters on the loch. The warmer upper layers of water can appear to travel in the opposite direction of the colder layer beneath it and create the illusion that a log is swimming against the current. Scientists believe that the sightings of logs and other debris moving in this apparently lifelike way trigger many false monster reports. 
In a 1979 article, California biologist Dennis Power and geographer Donald Johnson claimed that the surgeon's photograph was the top of the head, extended trunk, and flared nostrils of a swimming elephant photographed somewhere else and claimed to be from Loch Ness. In 2006, paleontologist and artist Neil Clark suggested that the traveling circuses might have allowed elephants to bathe in the loch. The trunk could be perceived as the head and neck, with the head and back the perceived humps. In support of this, Clark provided a painting. In 1933, the Daily Mirror published a picture with the caption, This queerly shaped tree trunk washed ashore in the Loch Ness may, it is thought, be responsible for the reported appearance of a monster. In a 1982 series of articles for New Scientist, Maurice Burton proposed that sightings of Nessie and similar creatures may be fermenting Scots pine logs rising to the surface of the loch. A decomposing log could not initially release gas caused by decay because of its high resin level. Gas pressure would eventually rupture a resin seal at one end of the log, propelling it through the water, sometimes to the surface. According to Burton, the shape of tree logs, with their branch stumps, closely resembles the descriptions of the monster. Obviously, the most popular theory is that the Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur, an order of prehistoric marine reptiles. Some believe that the Loch Ness is home to a small population of plesiosaurs that somehow survived the extinction event that killed off the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Or if they're not plesiosaurs, then maybe they're animals that evolved from them. There are a few problems with this theory, though. For one thing, Loch Ness is not very old in the grand scheme of things. The loch is only about 10,000 years old. Before then, it was frozen for about 20,000 years. But if the freshwater loch was not formed until recently, then how could a population of prehistoric monsters have been living there for 65 million years? Could they possibly have come in from the sea at the end of the last ice age? There is evidence of a massive flood around this time. Could it have washed Nessie into the loch from the sea and left it stranded when the floodwaters retreated? The problem with this explanation is that in 1994, scientists took core samples from the mud at the bottom of the lake and found no trace of salt water to support this hypothesis. And the only other way into the loch is through the wide but shallow River Ness. There's also the problem of food. Loch Ness is a huge lake, but its waters are dark. Suspended brown peat washed into the loch from the surrounding rivers prevents light from penetrating deeper than nine feet. Green algae, the bottommost rung of the food chain, cannot thrive in such low light conditions. Few algae means that there's little food for the microscopic zooplankton to eat. This in turn means less food for small fish, and thus less food for any large predators. A monster brood hiding out in the loch would need plenty of zooplankton to support plenty of fish, which in turn could support large creatures. But researchers have calculated that no more than 17 to 24 tons of fish live in the loch, surprisingly few for a lake this size. That is probably only enough to feed just 10 giant lake monsters, much too few to have a sustainable breeding colony. On top of all that, plesiosaurs are thought to be cold-blooded creatures who would need warm water to thrive, and the Loch Ness is quite chilly. The case for Nessie being a plesiosaur looks shaky, but there might be enough food to support another giant. In 1932, Miss McDonald reported seeing a crocodile-like creature swimming in the River Ness, which feeds into the Loch Ness. It had a short neck, long snout, and possibly even tusks. Her sighting led naturalists to suggest that the monster could be a colossal fish, such as the Baltic sturgeon. The biggest one ever discovered was 20 feet long, the same length as the largest great white sharks. While their average length is only 4 feet, that's still pretty sizable. They can also live for a hundred years. Records show that sturgeon do sometimes travel along Scotland's coast, and in 1871 a huge sturgeon was caught by a fisherman near the entrance to the River Ness. But these monster fish only solve the riddle for some of the Nessie sightings. Sturgeons are slow-swimming fish and could not cause the many unexplained speeding wakes seen on the loch. Zoologist, angler, and television presenter Jeremy Wade investigated the creature in 2013 as part of the series River Monsters and concluded that it is a Greenland shark. The Greenland shark, which can also reach up to 20 feet in length, inhabits the North Atlantic Ocean around Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and possibly Scotland. It is dark in color, with a small dorsal fin, and, according to biologists, the Greenland shark could survive in fresh water. A large eel was an early suggestion for what the monster was. Eels are found in Loch Ness, and an unusually large one would explain many sightings. Nessie believers dismissed the hypothesis because eels undulate side to side like snakes, rather than up and down, as the monster was described to move. 
Sightings in 1856 of a sea serpent in a freshwater lake nearby were explained as those of an oversized European eel. From 2018 to 2019, an international group of researchers undertook a massive project to document every organism in Loch Ness based on DNA samples. Their reports confirmed that European eels are still found in the loch. No DNA samples were found for large animals such as catfish, Greenland sharks, or, unfortunately, plesiosaurs. Many scientists now believe that giant eels account for many, if not most, of the sightings. Richard Freeman, a zoologist, said the idea of a prehistoric reptile in these cold northern lakes is a non-starter. However, the monsters could be some kind of large fish. I think the best bets are giant, sterile eels. The common eel swims out to the Sargasso Sea to breed and then die. The baby eels follow the centrails back to their ancestral freshwater homes, and the cycle begins again. Sometimes, however, a mutation occurs and the eel is sterile. These stay in fresh water and keep on growing. Known as eunuch eels, no one knows how old they get or how big. In February 2004, two Canadian tourists came upon a 25-foot eel floating in the shallows of Loch Ness. At first they thought it was dead, but when it began to move they beat a hasty retreat. In the 1980s, a 20-foot eel was reported in the Birmingham Ship Canal. Another 20-foot eel was supposedly caught in the cooling system in some aluminum works indoors. Locals have noted that it is well known that the Loch Ness is teeming with eels. No one knows accurately how many eels inhabit the loch because eels tend to live on or close to the lake bottom. Therefore, sonar devices, which can be adept at picking up fish in open water, cannot easily pick up eels which stay close to the sloping sides of the lake. According to Ronald Binns, a former member of the Loch Ness Phenomenon Investigation Bureau, there's probably no single explanation for the monster. He believes that an aspect of human psychology is the ability of the eye to see what it wants and expects to see. They could be misidentifications of known animals, misidentifications of inanimate objects or effects, reinterpretations of Scottish folklore, hoaxes, and exotic species of large animals. Binns does not call the sightings a hoax, but a myth in the truest sense of the term, and states that the monster is a sociological phenomenon. The possibility that there just might be something there continues to enthrall a small number for whom eyewitness evidence outweighs all other considerations. So what do you guys think? Is there a giant creature lurking in the Loch Ness? Perhaps an ancient beast, or a giant version of a more common animal? Could the sightings just be a case of mistaken identity? Or do you think it was all just a practical joke? Let me know your theories in the comments. The Loch Ness area still attracts numerous monster hunters every year. At the beginning of the 21st century, even with new technology at hand, the mystery is bigger than ever. Over the years, several sonar explorations were undertaken to locate the creature, but none were successful. In addition, numerous photographs allegedly show the beast, but most were discredited as fakes or depicting other animals or objects. Interest and belief in the animal has fluctuated since it was brought to the world's attention in 1933. Evidence of its existence is limited to eyewitness reports and a few much-disputed photographs, videos, and sonar readings. Despite the lack of conclusive evidence, the Loch Ness Monster remains popular and profitable. It's thought that the Loch Ness Monster contributes nearly $80 million annually to Scotland's economy. So that's the story of the Loch Ness Monster. I hope you guys liked it.